Good morning. There's no place this side of eternity than I would rather be than right here this morning with all of you. Amen? Isn't it wonderful to be together? It's a beautiful time of year, and it's such a blessing to be able to spend this time together. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10, a little bit, and in a lot of other places. So open your Bibles and devices to Luke chapter 10, and while you're doing so, I want to talk a little bit about some stuff I saw on the internet the other day. I was browsing around, and and I came across an article that shared some of the habits of the ultra-wealthy, specifically the habits of what they're choosing to do with their bodies when they pass away, and I found it quite interesting, because for the small sum of $200,000, you can have a team of specialized, uh, I don't even know what you call them, specialized people rush in right after you die, And they start the quick process of putting your body on ice, and they cool you down really fast, and they take you to a vat of liquid nitrogen, and they freeze your body just in case someday we figure out how to wake you up. Now, for a discounted rate, they'll just freeze your head, and so I'm not quite sure how that works. I guess they have an extra lot of faith in science being able to formulate some sort of bodies. But, I mean, we laugh, but... But this, the article, I mean, the people were very serious. They said, well, when you pass away, we're not so certain that's the end. I mean, we view ourselves as rescuers. I mean, we're coming in to, to put a pause in the process um, because there's going to be a day when, when science is going to be in a place where, where we can restore this biological function that people have. And so people have a lot of money, and they think, well, why not? Well, I think we have a reason why not. But... But it's interesting that even today, we're still asking the same questions and and pushing for the same things and have the same desires that humans have had throughout all of history. We desperately want to figure out how to reach the next beyond. We desperately want to figure out how this life cannot be it. We desperately want there to be something outside of just this meager existence that we know we're going to be able to live for a few years. We desperately want more. And so you look throughout cultures and throughout societies and you see that religions all over the world are providing some sort of answer to this issue of what happens when we die providing some sort of hope to people so that they can reach something beyond. And it would make sense that in a time when science is exalted as the ultimate God, there would be a subset of people looking to science even to provide those answers to life eternal. Here in Luke chapter 10, this lawyer asked Jesus the same question that's been asked for thousands of years. He didn't exactly do it with pure motives, But the fact that he was asking the question means that it was a central question that a lot of them had. In Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, we read, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, I mean, that's the question, the age-old and important question that we've been asking since the beginning. Death is a huge motivator for us. It's something that's looming out there on the horizon for all of us. And so from the beginning of time, we've wanted a way to escape it. The early Israelites had big debates about this. So you see the, uh, the rising up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they had different theologies on what happened after you died. So the Pharisees believed in a resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees didn't. And, and there was this constant debate happening. And so they're trying to wrangle Jesus into the, ba- the debate and, and, and trap him in his words. And, and, and he finds out that Jesus clearly believes in the resurrection, 
Um, But Jesus has a more fundamental understanding of it than any of them. Here, the lawyer combines two Old Testament teachings. The Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which we're going to read here in just a second. And another teaching from Leviticus 19. Now, we studied just a few weeks ago on a Sunday evening what it meant to love your neighbor. And I would love for y'all to to back up and spend some time looking at that lesson. I think that's an important um, outgrowth of what happens when we love God. But for the next four weeks here on Sunday morning, we're going to really zero in on this this teaching statement that's pulled from Deuteronomy and repeated three times in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and Luke by Jesus. And we're going to zero in on the elements of it and see what we can learn about our, our hearts and our souls and our mind and our strength. I want to read Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, give you a framework of where it comes from. Now, this is the commandment. The statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey." Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That would have been the the passage that the Israelites were drawn to. It was no surprise that the lawyer mind went to this because every morning from, from when he was a small child, he would have woke up and said this prayer. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This was a central teaching point. It was written on their, on, their, on their gates and on their doorpost. It was something that was carried close everywhere that they went. And so it would make sense that Jesus would have repeated and been drawn to this often. You know, as we look at this, uh, this teaching in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a little bit different each time. It's possible they were kind of referring to one of the same instances, but I don't think so. I think that this was probably something that came up often as people interacted with Jesus. This was something that he talked about often. And in here, he actually kind of flips the question and he puts it back on the lawyer. And when the lawyer repeats these four important elements, he confirms that it was indeed the truth. So as we break down these four things that are spoken of here in Luke chapter 10, you're going to see some considerable overlap from week to week. You're going to see that many of these four elements share a lot of similarities. And I think that that's good because that means that we're going to get to hear over and over again some of the things that were super important for Jesus to talk about. But I think you're also going to see as we step through these four different elements drawn out some differences. And that's important for us to be drawn to as well because the differences are the reason that Jesus spoke of them in separate terms. So we're going to find the, the similarities and the difference both help us grow in our, in our love for God. And I'm excited to walk through that over the next four weeks. This week in particular, we're going to zero in on the first element, the heart. We're going to zero in on the first element, the heart. Now, we are quick to separate the immaterial from the material. I think that's probably kind of... Um, maybe taught to us. It's a part of the culture that we live in. Um, we see the difference in the physical and the non-physical, the tangible and the non-tangible. So, so we have science on one hand, and, and, and it, it describes the things that we can see and touch and feel. And then if you want to talk about things that you can't see and touch and feel, then you come to church and you listen to that preacher guy talk because he talks about all of these immaterial things. And we kind of tend to put them in two different categories. So we approach a teaching like this, and we hear these different elements that Jesus lays out. And I think that we're quick to try to categorize them into the material and the immaterial. What is Jesus talking about? So we see the heart, and and we hear, love him with all of your heart, and we think, well, a heart, that has to do with the immaterial. That's how we feel. And he says, then, love him with all of your soul. And we think, well, okay, that's a... Maybe, maybe, our, maybe something that we uh, use to make decisions, our, our, uh, 
um, the choices that we make, maybe, our, our will. Um, we see, love him with all of your mind. Well, that's something on the inside. That feels a little more real than the other two, but that's, that's kind of our intellect. Um, that's, a, that's the way that our, our mind operates, the thought process, how we function and perceive reality. And then he says, love him with all of your strength. And we say, okay, that's kind of shifting a little towards things that are real. And, and that has to do with our body and, and, and how we operate in the world. And then, and then if we follow it on, we even see that he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And we say, okay, that's the, the physical outpouring of all of these things, and I, I think some of that may be true, but I wonder, is it accurate biblically? As we uh, look at this term heart, is that really what Jesus meant to communicate? Is that really what our takeaway is supposed to be, that we're supposed to take these little, these little um, separate um, elements of, of existence and, and somehow work God into all of them? Maybe, but I'm not so sure. In fact, as I started studying and trying to understand the heart, I got to be real honest, I got myself a little confused. I mean, it's used in a lot of different ways throughout Scripture. In Hebrew, it's, the word is labab, and it's actually translated differently throughout the Old Testament, depending on the context. It was a pretty common way to talk about a lot of different things. In, in Greek, we see cardia. Uh, cardiac, that would make sense, cardia in the, in the Greek. And even in the New Testament, it's talked about in a lot of complex and different ways. So we're going to do something this morning that's a little out of the ordinary for me. I like to zero in on one text and kind of stay close to that text and really unpack it. But as I was studying, I, I had to kind of open up and do more of a word study. And so we're going to actually walk through a lot of different verses this morning. <clears throat> it may feel like drinking from a fire hose for a little bit, and I'm going to go fast. So I want you all to be patient with me. I'm going to put the verse references on the screen. The text is not going to be up there. So if you are someone who wants to go back and really study later, take a picture, take some pictures as we go, and then you can read on your own. But the point of this is, is not to study the context or the teaching of each, each individual verse. What I want you to look for and see is how, is the, how does God view the heart throughout all of Scripture? So we start with uh, it being viewed as a physical organ. Um, even in the Old and the New Testament, we see this. In Genesis 18.5, he talks about, um, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves. And there the word yourselves is actually labab, heart. That you may refresh your heart, and after that you may pass on. <clears throat> in Judges 19.5, on the fourth day they arose early in the morning and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. In Acts 14.17, it says, for he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So we see that the first element when the Bible talks about the heart, it's this, it's this physical part of us that, that gets nourished by food itself, a, a physical part of our being. But there in Acts, you see that he also slid in that extra little term with food and gladness. You see, the heart as the center of physical life quickly moved to be talked about as, as if standing for the person as a whole. And that's really where the complexity of this word comes in because it, it talks about a, a lot of different um, ways of, of, or it talks about the heart in a lot of different ways when it comes to the human experience. So in Matthew 13, 15, we see it's the seat of intelligence. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So you see, the heart is, the, is spoken of as something with which you exercise this muscle of understanding or intelligence. Now, I think it follows from that that the heart is also involved in the thinking process, and we see that as well. In Luke 1.66 um, those as Jesus is brought to the temple and, and, and Simeon talks, it says, All who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So the heart is the place where these thoughts were, were being processed and laid up. Mary is spoken of the same way in Luke 2.19. It says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
So the heart was a place of pondering. Isaiah 46, 8, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. The word mind there, kebab, heart. So the heart was a place where they recall things and remember things. But more than just that, it was also the, the seat of the will. It wasn't just a place where you think. It's a place where you make decisions and, and put that thinking into action. So we see in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the heart is the place where we make decisions of the will. Acts 5, 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? heart. You have not lied to man, but to God, the text says. So we see the heart is a place where you can contrive and, and decide to do things. Maybe they're good at times, and maybe they're not so good. Romans six seventeen says, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart. So you see there, obedience flows from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. So we, we think with our heart, we make decisions with our heart, but it's also the place where feelings come from. This is where we first go to when we think of hearts. In Psalms 4-7, it says, You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In Psalm 143-4, Therefore my spirit faints within me, and my heart is appalled. So our heart can be a place where we experience negative emotions, and our heart can be a place where we experience joy or positive emotions. In fact, both of those are seen in Isaiah 65, 14. Behold, my servant shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart, and shall well for the breaking of spirit. Okay? So we see all these different emotions that we experience. They're repeated again in the, the New Testament. Um, John 16, 6, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. James 3.14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. So the heart is definitely the place from which our emotions are seated and come from, but it's more than just that. In the scripture, we see that it is represented as the center of morality. Let's see if I can make this point. Hebrew had, had no word for conscience, so the term heart was often used. So, for instance, in 1 Samuel 25, 31, um, it says, My Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord working salvation himself. Conscience there is actually kebab, heart. Or 1 John 3, 19 through 21 talks about our heart is that which condemns us. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So the heart's where we uh, have this determiner or this, this weight between good and bad. And we're, we're weighing these decisions, a, a conscience, you might say. 1 Samuel 16, 7, we see that the heart is spoken of as representing the true nature of, of Saul. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, we see that depravity comes from the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And in Matthew 15, 19, again, we see depravity. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So the heart is where this moral decisions, good versus bad, comes from. We also see heart as the center of spirituality. The heart is the root of the problem, and that means it's going to be where God does his working. So in Romans 2.15, it says, They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So the things of God were written on their hearts. In Matthew 13, 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. 
So this is where the, the good news is spread, where, where it is placed. The heart is the element within us where this speaks to. In 1 Samuel 10, 9, when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all of these signs came to pass that day. So this is where God interacts. In Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, God says, And I will give them one heart and a new spirit, and I will put within them, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. In Romans 10, 10, For with the heart... One believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We also see it's where God dwells, kind of extending the center of spirituality idea. 2 Corinthians 1.22 And he who has also put a seal on us and given his spirit in our heart as a guarantee. It's where the spirit lives. Ephesians 3.17 So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Romans 5.5 5, And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. All right, I'm done. And I, and I cut a lot of them out, so you can thank me later. As I was, had all this laid out on my desk and I was studying this week, man, that's a lot of different ways that God chooses to talk about the heart. Um, it's complex, and I, and, and I was struggling to wrap my mind around it, so I had made these notes, and I'd kind of put them in these categories that I just shared with you, and, and I was pouring over and think, well, what do, I, what do I talk about? I mean, he uses it in all these different ways, so what does he mean here in Luke? I, I mean, I've got to figure out how to stand up and, and, and tell the, the church I mean, what is Jesus affirming here in, in Luke chapter 10? And as I started looking through this list that, I mean, and these are, are notably my words, they're not from Scripture, but, but I see this idea emerging, this, this common theme in all of the things that we talked about. In all of the ways that the term is used, do you see a connection between them? Seat, center, seat, center, center, center. So I try to search for a short phrase to kind of summarize all of the, all of the commonalities and how Scripture uses this term. That's what keeps coming up. This idea of center or origin. And that fits perfect in the context of what Jesus is trying to communicate here, I believe, in Luke chapter 10. I mean, as I back up and think, okay, how would I define heart as used here in the Gospel of Luke? I would say this, the heart is that from which who you are emanates. The heart is the most internal, foundational element of who you are. Your heart is your center point. So if you follow any single action or any single thought or any decision that you make and you follow it back through the process of where it came from and you finally got all the way to the inside to the starting point, that would be your heart. That would be what Jesus is talking about. It is the center point of you. Now, I think most humans love God the way they love other humans. We have limits set by our own love of self. I'm going to say that one more time. I think most of the time we as humans love God the way that we love other humans. So we have these limits set by our love of self. In other words, at the very center point of you is you. And that's the most natural state for us to find ourselves in, uh, I mean, we may put a high priority on our spouse or on our children or, or even on God and the people here. But what we really struggle with, they may get close to the center, but, but they're in the very center. They're in the very center I often find myself. And that means, by definition, there's a limit. There's a limit on the love that I give to all else. I think this is what Jesus was trying to communicate here at the very beginning of this passage is that you have to get yourself out of the way. You want eternal life? Yeah, I do too. 
And it's not going to be found in a $200,000 vat of liquid nitrogen or anything like that. It's going to be found in something a lot more simple, but maybe in a sense a lot more difficult. It means that we have to get ourselves out of the way. And Jesus backed up and he said, hey, you need to understand from the very beginning of time, all of the law and the prophets have been trying to communicate this exact same thing to you. This exact same thing of, of getting yourself out of the way and making God the center point. The Israelites struggle with this. We struggle with it today. And so I ask myself, what does it look like for you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart? What does it look like? Now, uh, most of you uh, learned at a very early age this model of the solar system that has the sun with all of the planets orbiting around it. Really fascinating to learn as a child and we make mobiles and models of it and we present it to our classmates at school and no one today really debates that this is true but it was back in the 16th century when Copernicus presented this mathematical model for how everything might rotate around the sun and he got a lot of feedback from it, a lot of negative feedback from it and uh, in fact then Galileo pulled out his little telescope and he confirmed all of these mathematical models and all of a sudden all of these theologians kind of had a mess on their hand you want to know why because they believed that the crown jewel of God's creation us the earth that had to be the center of the universe that had to be the point around which everything else rotated why because we're the crown jewel of God's creation we're obviously the center of the universe that's that's how it works and and I got to be honest no matter how hard I try no matter how much I believe in this model that we see up here on the screen no matter how much I know that to be true there is still a piece inside of me that thinks you know but I'm the crown goal jewel of God's creation and maybe the physical universe rotates around the sun, but it kind of feels like the world rotates around me. I would guess some of y'all feel like that too. Some of you may remember the Truman Show that came out in 1998. It's been a long time since I've seen it. I was trying to think of a sermon illustration. This, this show was about a, a, a baby, his name is Truman, and he was raised on set, on, the, on a television set from birth. And all of the world tuned in to watch the life of Truman that was being filmed with all of these hidden cameras. I mean, this was like legit reality TV. They were following this guy 24 hours a day, following his life. He, it was unbeknownst to him that everyone in his life was an actor, and all of the cameras were focused on him all of the time. And so they had paid actors that would come in and promote different products, and all of the world would tune in, and sometimes the ratings would drop, and as things got exciting in Truman's life, the ratings would rise, and it, and it turned into quite an ordeal as he started realizing, hold on, it's kind of like everything revolves around me. It's kind of like all of these things. Now, I'll, I don't want to ruin the end of the show, but he does sell to the edge of the set, and he runs into the wall, and he walks up some hidden stairs, and he escapes. And so it's all a, all a happy ending. But why was that show successful? Because it played into something that we all very much feel on the inside. Maybe it kind of is all about me. Man, it's hard to separate that you from everything else. It's easy to get so involved in yourself that you feel like the world revolves around you. It's easy for me to make myself the center point from which everything emanates. And all of Scripture... All of Scripture from beginning to end is trying to tell you don't do that because it's not true. Life is not best lived with you at the center. You're not that from which around everything uh, orbits. You aren't the star of the show. The star of the show is supposed to be God. Is God at the center? Or really are you at the center? This next image is, uh, I felt like, best represents what I'm trying to communicate. We've all, uh, we've all been unable to resist the urge of walking up to a perfectly still body of water and disrupting the peace by throwing a rock into it. We all know what that looks like, the ripple that, that begins in the central point and makes its way outward to the edge. When I talk about the heart, this is what I mean. It's that center point, the 
the center point that everything else is coming out of. It makes me wonder, what's my life really centered around? What's starting the ripples that eventually reach the shore that everyone else sees? All of the law was designed to help people bring God into his rightful, rightful central position. And I believe Jesus carried on that legacy in his teachings and saying that, look, you want to reach eternal life? This, this is it. You need to start at the core. You need to start at the center. Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. That means God. God is the one that starts the ripples. Now, maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you come today wrestling with the idea of death. I think this passage is great news because it tells us that there is a definitive way around it and you don't have to be rich and you don't have to save up $200,000 and freeze your body in a vat of liquid nitrogen. Jesus says it's, it's a lot more simple than that. You don't have to go through and accomplish this checklist of tasks. If you want to have eternal life, then you need to start by transforming who you are. You need to start with a transformation that begins at the center and radiates outward. This is about living a different, transformed life. A transformation that changes every element of who you are from the core. And it means that you have to let go of something that's difficult but very important. You have to let go of yourself. In the New Testament, we see this pattern emerging over and over again. People see this and they say, ooh. I maybe do need to be living for something bigger than myself because I can now see that myself is very temporary and it's going to expire. And as they do, they begin to believe, oh, I believe that there's something bigger out there. I believe that Jesus was God's solution to this. And, and because of my belief, I'm going to change. We call that repentance. Belief and repentance is always accompanying throughout Acts with baptism. Baptism is how we attach ourselves to the saving blood of Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning and you're wondering about eternal life, you're wrestling with death, I'm here to tell you that we have an answer, an answer has been given to us. The transformation starts at baptism, and that's what transforms our core and puts God in his rightful place. And I would encourage you not to leave today if that question is on your heart and you haven't taken care of it. It could be that you are a saved believer, but you're wrestling. I fight this every day, keeping my heart focused on the things it needs to be focused on. And you know what? That's one of the reasons that we gather together in this place, is to encourage one another and to provide accountability to help us recenter our hearts on the things that are most important. So if you're wrestling with that today, and if it's particularly urgent, we want to help you. You can come forward during the invitation song. We would love to pray for you. We would love to partner with you. We will hold you accountable and walk with you. If there is anyone here with a need this morning, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing.